based individuals who are also highly educated, highly motivated and have been prepped and been preparing over the past few years. Are these modules are all connected or should they be looked at in isolation? More importantly, the modus operandi of these so-called individual outfits or radicalized outfits, be it Assam, be it Madhya Pradesh, be it Uttar Pradesh, be it south of the Vindhyas in Karnataka, Kerala and Tamil Nadu, have they started or perfected the art of camouflage using social media platforms, encrypted platforms and also figured out this narrative of camouflaging their identities across communities. So these are ISIS radicals, but they are having identities which give the portrayal prime FSI of a Hindu extremist act. Is there perhaps an attempt to revive the narrative of the past of saffron terror, Hindu extremism, etc.? Or is this their way of trying to subvert the system and use it to its own to, to their own advantage? There are plenty of aspects to talk about, but the rising concern and the core concern remains the rise of radicals within and that too towards the south of Bharat. We've got news just coming through. Our investigations editor Manoj Gupta getting us these details. So let's start straight with that, ladies and gentlemen. Big news coming in. So here's a CNN News 18 exclusive on the Mengluru blast. And this is as per top intelligence sources, our investigations editor Manoj Gupta and of course uh, Arunima uh, getting us our editor, Home Affairs, getting us a lot of these details. So let's try and understand what Manoj Gupta is getting us about Sharik. Sharik was very, very careful about the use of technology. He never used a phone in his own name and always used fake IDs, ladies and gentlemen. So that is one aspect and SIMs acquired from those identities. He was radicalized since 2018, so four years this entire process of radicalization has been on. He was more radical since 2020 in the Lashkar case. And his idea was to keep on carrying out attack. His idea was to keep on carrying on attacks without coming into the picture. He has a small gang and all the members were given isolated tasks. The group Al-Hind planned a major attack very, very soon. These members were from this Al-Hind module, Al-Hind Trust in Bangalore 2020. And their mastermind has got a 3 lakh uh, 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 reward on his head, bounty on his head. And the connect is there with Mateen, who's now currently operating from the Middle East. But uh, Sharik also wanted to do something before his death. So they all had decided, koi na koi karnama karke jayenge. So they were ready and they knew that the end goal on the road that they were in was death, but they wanted to create damage. They had identified places of high impact and agencies feel the interrogation will now be crucial to evolve and derive many more linkages and other members. Now, here's a, here are two, three aspects which need to be noted, ladies and gentlemen. The use of SIM cards, the use of fake IDs, and the use of encrypted social media platforms which provide you privacy but they are being used actively by members who are enemies of the state. So how do you deal with this? Fake Aadhaar cards and also using the good Samaritanism in Bharatiya to help somebody procure phone cards uh, by on their identities and go ahead and commit acts of treachery against the state. So all of that also very, very interesting dimensions. But try and, let's try and understand the terror tentacles and how this is a multi-city trail, ladies and gentlemen. Sharik is from Shimoga. Now, there was ruckus in Shimoga, 15th of August, post the, the Independence Day. There was ruckus, there were fights in Shimoga. And after that, and after that, September 3rd and 4th, Coimbatore, he moves Mohammed Sharik visits the city of Coimbatore. So from Shimoga, he heads to Coimbatore. He's believed to have met multiple persons on logical support, logistical support. Was he part of that same module, ISIS radical module in Coimbatore? Is there a connection to uh, Hashim? Is there a connection to Mubin? These are all aspects of investigation. And somewhere one gets the feeling right down near gut instinctively, that all are connected. Investigation has to prove it. September, other Tamil Nadu cities, Nagar Koil, Uti, where he procured one fake Aadhaar card. So he moves around. He visits Kerala. He goes to Alua and Kochi. 
and then after that he visits karnataka again towards the latter half of september where in hubli he procures another fake aadhar card that he procures then on the 20th of september there is a blast in shivamogga in karnataka an ied made from gelatin sticks potassium etc the blast is similar to mengaluru blast it happened on the banks of the tungabhadra was that just practice there were two people arrested at that time one of them who ran away was this man sharik police probing if this was a trial run for the mengaluru attack and sharik was named absconder in that case end september he returned to mysuru procured raw material and assembled the id over two months and 23rd october there is a blast in coimbatore one killed and the person mubin linked to the sri lanka suicide bomber and he is also linked to sharik probing links whether or not they were all connected now there is this region which is in coimbatore highly dense population of uh, muslims there and hashim the easter bomber was the one who was radicalizing and he was preaching actively and moving actively in that region so are they all connected somewhere that something which is part of investigation mengaluru id blast in an auto rickshaw that uh, that sharik was injured in hospital allegedly carrying the id to a blast location so he conducts a trial run interestingly the phosphorus that he is used along with the gelatin sticks is using by shaving match sticks so he's bought lots of matches from different different places collecting the matches and he spent time shaving the phosphorus at the tip of these matches to get enough phosphorus because phosphorus is incendiary so nuts and bolts are shrapnel gelatin for the explosion and fire incendiary all three elements were mixed and that's how they tried to do let's try and look at the overall isis threads in south india we're spending some time so that us viewers can understand this ladies and gentlemen abdul mateen talha is the mastermind behind the Al Hind ISIS module he was part of that Al Hind trust Gurupalya if i remember and then he ran and when he ran there was a bounty placed by the NIA the NIA has put out a tweet listing out his antecedents so he's connected Jamisha Mubeen Zarain Hashim Zarain Hashim is the suicide bomber behind and he was the one active in that area in Coimbatore where he was preaching actively and he was also recruiting and radicalizing are these all from that lot that's something which the investigators now have to pen down pin down mohammad azuruddin was the mastermind in the isis kerala tamil nadu module he was also busted so somewhere are all of they all of them linked and does this very clearly point to a highly rising rate of radicals and radicalism in the south of our country karnataka kerala and tamil nadu and somewhere do they all seem connected let's dive into this and how are we going to address these challenges so we'll try and talk about that with our experts this evening let's go across to our panelists <clears throat> Nirva Mehta editor of English Op India is with us Abhijit Ayer Mitra senior fellow IPCS is with us we also have BS Arun senior journalist then uh, Nirmal Kaur ji former IPS officer with us and we have Lieutenant General KJ Singh army veteran and defense analyst Namaste and Jai Hind to everybody thank you very very much yes. this is a matter of grave concern for all of us as citizens of this country because there are multiple levels of this narrative and modus operandi that we need to understand Nirmal Kaur ji first up these people are so highly radicalized and so highly motivated that they're willing to bide their time and they are willing to take the hard route to buy matchsticks and to shave off the phosphorus to get enough to make an incendiary and not do it just once but twice or thrice even in tests shows a high level of motivation they are all engineers highly educated and they are using fake <coughs> hindu ids so they also are aware of the political narrative that they want to set i think it it is they are highly educated people highly motivated because they all looking at jannat right in front of them they are motivated radicalized to think that if they accomplish this uh, great jannat awaits them you know where yes. all the pleasures which are forbidden here are going to be there along with all the apsaras the hoos and the wines and all kinds of pleasures which are denied to them on this earth so that is what they are looking forward to is jannat that is behind their motivation you know this kind of radicalized things and it is you said it is now a lot you know concentrated in the southern india 
south of Indias. Mm. I think that is no surprise because Kerala has been a boiling cauldron for many, many decades now. Mm. Not only that, PFI, you know, all kinds of things, you know, I think maybe these people have PFI linkages too. Mm. Because all these organizations, after all, it's like a spaghetti bowl. You know, where you can't, you know, really, you pick out a spaghetti and all others come. You know, it, it's a spaghetti kind of a thing. You cannot mm. isolate any organization like that because they do have interlinkages and it is no wonder at all that it is happening in the south of India because if you see post-independence also the first time uh, this IUML, Indian Union Muslim League hmm. they, you know when the Indira Gandhi brought down the government of I think it was late 50s in Kerala, Namudri Path government yeah. and then you know this, uh, not Indira Gandhi sorry the Congress brought Congress. down the, the government of uh, the, uh, the Congress government and they uh, made a government, formed a government with support of IUML. Mm. So that is the first time, you know, this uh, demoralized Muslim League had finished. Muslim League wanted Pakistan and they had taken their Pakistan and gone. The only thing is that all, most of them who wanted Pakistan and voted for Pakistan like Muslims of UP and Bihar and, mm. you know, they stayed back. Indeed. They stayed back and then they stayed back and then they formed another Muslim League here and the same ethos and what with, the, you know, this AIMIM, the mm. Etmaidul party and all the Muslim parties coming together, massacring Hindus and, you know, all kinds of things, the same agenda, the same narrative, Hindu, Muslim and, uh, you know, the riots against mm. Hindus continued and that kind of ethos they brought and now we have had 70 years of it. So this is only a logical outcome that with their growing population and the growing radicalization and the growing raw fields which you are, your system is giving to them, your political system, the way you are pacify, pacifying them, pampering them, bringing them up, appeasing them in every which way, you know, and also bringing out the most rotten, begotted elements among them. Mm. You know, you want the Malvis and Mullahs, you're applicating them, not the educated class among them. You're applicating them by allowing them their Badarsas, where you don't even know what is being taught. Mm. Uh, the, and uh, instead of scientific education, the educated gentry, no, but we should have a pe, but pe uh, Kaurji, the kind trend of is different. Syllabus. The trend is different. The, the, I, there is a point where you make that the moderates were not encouraged, but the fundamentalists were being appeased. That's a very fair point. But Lieutenant General KJ Singh, most of these... I think uh, that is going on even now. Mo, mo, most of these, most of this module that has been busted, be it in Coimbatore, be it in Kerala, be it in Tamil Nadu, all, all of them are educated. They are engineers, Lieutenant General KJ Singh. And they um, have figured out, even in Bangla, even yes. that Bangladeshi model, uh, Nirmal Korchi, I'm just bringing in General KJ Singh, even the Bangladeshi model that was busted in Assam, a 10th standard woman who was part of that module had been coached how to open and operate a chat room on a dark web, on dark web, and also use platforms which are highly encrypted. So they have figured um, out tech too, to escape uh, scrutiny. Uh, Jain, the Anand, the... Thank you for having me on your platform. The issue is very grave and serious. And we are all saying whether they are connected or not, the connection doesn't have to be physical. Hmm. Connection today is just drawing an inspiration. They are even connected to Zakir Naik, I'm telling you, because they are seeing his videos, they are getting inspired. So let us not look at those physical, they would be required for forensics for investigation. But believe you me, all these pe people, Jamesha, Mobin, Mateen, Al Tala, all of them are connected. And these organizations, it's worrying. And we have to, and see, uh, also, mm. somewhere, uh, the previous speaker was bringing out, we have to keep our focus on both. Uh, mm. On the so-called radicalizing madarsas, uh, and also on these kind of people. So here obviously uh, in these states I am very concerned because there seems to be some kind of a tendency to wish it away, to play it down. Initially in Coimbatore they said it's not a terrorist act. Even in this Bengaluru thing, one leader said that it is just been given a color. So let us not play politics now. Let's call Terrorist are terrorist, and let's have zero tolerance on that. And it's time to revamp our intelligence organizations. Somewhere here I feel that we were late in banning PFI. We should have banned it five, six years back. Mm. There should be zero tolerance on this. Because uh, peninsular India is the future of India. Mm. And if you are going to allow it to become infested with terrorists, 
then there will be no investments. Hmm. There will be no, uh, nobody will come to India for, after all, they, they are, our, our major uh, production centers are in Bangalore, in Hyderabad, hmm. and in uh, Chennai. And we are, we are not going to uh, allow this to take this shape. Hmm. So it's high time. And also somewhere I feel that courts must also realize I'm not trying to be a uh, little, uh, you know, uh, complicit in my comments. Hmm. But people should not be bailed out like this. Right. People, and if they are bailed out, there should be strict conditions. Hmm. And they should be monitored. Hmm. And also, I know it's difficult, hmm. but Aadhaar should not be accepted on CSV, especially hmm. for giving SIM. Hmm. We have to have stringent rules. Hmm. Let the subscriber base come down. Hmm. But let us be strict about giving Aadhaar SIMs, hmm. Aadhaar based SIMs. So Anand, all in all, it's a, it, it's a, it, it's a struggle for us. Hmm. And especially with the elections happening in Karnataka, hmm. we'll have to redouble our budget and our uh, but, uh, see, sort of in, coordination in, between various agencies. See, here, and here. state intelligence agencies have a major role to play. So, so intelligence can give you inputs. Uh, who will make the arrest? Intelligence will give you inputs that there is some amount of radical activity is happening. But how do you arrest a person just because he's gone ahead and attended a sermon? or may have a particular very strong views. Can you put a person behind bars? It's not possible, B.S. Arun. The other, the other aspect is this giving cover fire. This giving cover fire and appeasement has now perhaps become a compulsion. Now, so much so that Netas are turning around and saying, because there is election, that's why there is some terror activity just to create Mahal. Now, how can you make a statement like that? Because will you put a political agenda over and above the interests of the country? Nobody wants a terror attack. Why would anybody want a terror attack? Yes, uh, definitely so. Uh, unfortunately, the political parties might take advantage of this, uh, which they should not. I think this is a time when everybody should come together and uh, give full cooperation uh, to the uh, state government and to the police. Uh, the police have done a, a remarkable job. While the incident happened, uh, you know, day before yesterday night, yesterday morning itself, mm. the police. Uh, uh, you know, came out with the uh, uh, with the investigation uh, result, saying that it's a terrorist act and not an accident. So, when this is the case, the political parties uh, should not be taking uh, the sides. I you know which they normally do, and uh, uh, you know, give give cooperation to the state government. Otherwise, you know, they 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 also get exposed in this entire uh, entire issue. And what is now required is uh, you know political sagacity and not uh, one-upmanship. Look at what happened uh, uh, as, uh, as I'm going across to Abhijit Ayer Mitra, Chennai. Tamil Nadu police raid happened. In Chennai, they, they uh, raided two homes. They found nearly 150 phones, scores of SIM cards. They found computers. So these people are technologically also equipped. They are using platforms which claim to be highly encrypted, much ahead of even the common Janmanas has got, uh, got an idea that these platforms exist. So, Anand, you know, the thing is, terrorist organizations always run rings around uh, police agencies everywhere in the world. It isn't new. Uh, if you remember during the Russian Chechen war, uh, you know, the Chechen terrorists had uh, sophisticated uh, uh, Russian anti tank weapons, mm. uh, even more uh, 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 sophisticated than what the Russian army itself had at that point of time. So, you know, uh, the way they innovate, because today technology has become so accessible. You know how dynamite sort of democratized uh, uh, terror uh, in the 1800s and 1900s. Uh, what technology has done is it's added a different level of democratization of terror. And remember, this guy was linked to ISIS. Yeah. And ISIS's entire uh, uh, radicalization module is a sort of work from home online uh, course. So if the rest of the world only caught up to online uh, coaching, uh, school coaching from home during COVID, mm. ISIS had actually started this up, uh, you know, 10 years earlier. They were literally technology pioneers in this sphere. Now, you know, this is where we need to understand, you know, like the Alcoholics Anonymous prayer, God, give me the wisdom to uh, uh, realize what I cannot change and the courage to change what I can. Hmm. There are certain things we will never be able to control. So, for example, the phosphorus. Hmm. You know, there is no way we can actually track guys buying matchsticks in large numbers and chipping off the phosphorus from the uh, tips. Yeah. This is not something we can do. 
Hmm. However, there are two other things that we could have done, and we need to find out why it was not done. Hmm. First, is the uh, uh, SIM card that was brought with the Aadhaar. Now, when I went and bought my Airtel SIM card, I can tell you my Aadhaar was seen, my face was checked, and there was a facial verification that was done for it. Yeah. In this case, why was it not done? Because this was another gentleman called Prem Kumar's Aadhaar card, which should have had completely different details, which the system, which the verification system at the store should have uh, been able to tell. Hmm. Will the store attendant then be taken to task for giving out Aadhaars without verifying details? Because you know this works where every level acts as a check and balance. The second was that you know the Aadhaar was also used to rent a, a small room, a, a rental property. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but in Delhi, I don't know if it's the same mm. case in Bangalore. Mm. But in Delhi, if you uh, uh, rent something, it goes for police verification. The police actually come yes. and check on you, mm. like they do for a passport. Yeah. In this case, why was it not done? We know very often what happens is that you know it's uh, sort of chalta hai. I've literally been in aircraft uh, 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 check-in lines. Where certain people in front of me have taken three, four liters worth of shampoo in when you are not allowed more than hundred mLs worth of liquid or gel onto a plate, right? So this kind of a lax attitude has to go. The thing is, the solutions to this kind of thing are very easy. But to bring this back to what you brought about, how Chennai police reacted very different from Karnataka police. The sad thing is, unlike say France, where everybody is on board on how to tackle terror and Islamic radicalism, be it the left or the right, mm. here there is a very significant vote bank politics happening. We are a pre-industrial state where you know identity politics becomes very very salient, and Tamil Nadu is clearly one of those states where you know uh, uh, mm. a appeasement of criminality is seen somehow as getting votes. Now, what does that tell you about the voter? Gee. What does it tell you about the leader? We need to remember that with the Sunni community, not with the Shia, but with the Sunni community in this country, it remains feudal. It hasn't changed since 1857 when they were largely dispossessed by the British, and they continue to be in the grips of these feudal lords, who essentially use them as shock troops and foot soldiers and it, literally cannon fodder, or in this case, bomb fodder, to die in large numbers. So that they themselves can get away yeah. with huge concessions from the state property, God see, knows what all, not. See, all of that, uh, there is a rationale, but what beats all logic is that these are all engineers. These are all people who have got modern education, who know that not the earth, is, who know that the earth is round and the universe has multiverses. They know beyond the the concepts of physics. They are not stuck in a in a in a in a rudimentary you know land where they believe you know of fantasy. No, they have got the ability to use logic. They they have so, the know, Anand, this is they, not they surprising. have the, I, 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 I'm just saying they have the ability to use logic. Still, they are so highly radicalized and so far gone that they believe that this narrative that's been set politically is right. And they need to do something, and they are the ones who can correct it. So they've been able. They, right. There is the ability to brainwash enlightened minds or educated minds to that level. That's also something which is shocking. I just want to also put out another worrying factor. Now, uh, let's just look at this deflecting blame for terror. Now, is this also a pattern which we should worry about? Look at what happened at 2611, ladies and gentlemen. In 2611, the attackers carried fake Indian IDs. They posed as students. And more importantly, they all posed as Hindu students. They had mobile phones with Indian SIMs, Kasab War, Kalava. Uh, this is what was said by Rakesh Maria, ex-Mumbai police uh, commissioner. Let's try and draw the parallels with what happened with the Mengaluru blast. Sharik bought two fake Aadhaar cards and uh, these were seized. The suspect posed as Hindu, Premraj and Surendran. The bid to blame, once again, Hindu extremism or Nazi Hindu. So they've just tweaked the narrative, but police sources again claiming. So Nirva, this is also another worrying pattern that one of these successes could have also tilted the narrative. Uh, narrative has been going on since a long time. They've been wanting to talk more and more about how uh, uh, terrorism has no region, which is true, but terrorist uh, majority of them unfortunately do. Mm. And which is why the whole Hindu terrorist and Hindu uh, uh, which is also why the Kasab thing that you brought up, even Sharik in this case was having a Hindu ID. Uh, so uh, the Aadhaar was in his uh, was in a Hindu name. Police tracked down the the Prem Raj fellow whose name the Aadhaar was in. They talked to the father. They got the local police to uh, identify and inter interrogate. So if there were anything else, if 
uh, things had gone slightly differently we would all have known that one mm. premraj uh, you know a hindu man had uh, carried out a terror attack mm. uh, so uh, which is also very similar to uh, how the narrative was being built built around the kolkata terror attack mm. uh, for the longest time they refused to acknowledge it as a terror attack mm. Uh, as mm. it was a suicide bomb attack, yes. or which went probably went off before it reached its destination. Uh, it was just a cylinder blast. Even now, the majority of the search results you talk about, if you look for Coimbatore blast, that the Coimbatore cylinder blast. It's not a terror attack. So there is a, a pattern that the Hindu uh, terror is being uh, it's, it's being talked about as Hindu terror just to counter the other narrative. Mm. Uh, but it's actually <coughs> being counterproductive you're just try, uh, you know creating more and more pressure between the communities this way um, hmm. so he, no but they, their yeah. their idea their agenda is different to portray india under the current leadership and the current disposition in a particular manner and anything that suits their uh, narrative and they want to cause damage also and the, each person each of these people working in a different manner uh, or or a different agenda but they all created lone wolves nirmal ji are you not surprised the other point is that intelligence agencies have said that they have identified these people as radicalized but they cannot round them up because the courts question the cops and they don't allow them to detain them beyond a certain point yes. some of these people were even sent to deradicalization camps but to no avail so what's the solution nirmal ji Yes, dear. I think uh, for radicalization, I mean, how do you prove it? How you bring it into evidence, and how do you prove it beyond any doubt that the person is radicalized? Mm. There is that procedural and evidentiary lacuna there, but it is also true that they are masquerading as saffron terror while you know they are committing all these uh, acts inspired by the ISIS module, and they want to they are radicalized uh, Islamists and they want to build a khilafat or they want to. Build them um, Islamist India. That is their goal eventually, and for that they don't mind giving up their lives, and that is what they are doing. Mm. And uh, this uh, this is a very complicated problem, you know, bringing in evidence before the courts and satisfying the courts. Even this UAPA is so criticised a law, mm. but it is needed. And uh, again, at the same time, we have to have you know curbs and constraints and checks and balances that it is not misused. But where required. you know there also we lose out where it is very seriously required there also the police loses out in front of the courts because courts have a very very liberal view as if you know you know sometime i think it was laski who said yeah. that needs of different times are different Correct. but what pertains in a terror situation cannot be the same of a peace time peace loving america where yeah. there, there there are no terror incidents before say 911 yeah. so that kind of uh, state and the situation that prevails in india there are two different things so courts have to also be sensitized to the prevailing situation in the country and of course the judges i mean they also read newspapers they are very well aware they are very erudite citizens and they have arrived where they have arrived by dint of their hard work and mm. perseverance and their knowledge and wisdom so they should also look at the need of the hour police uh, does a lot of hard work and so many times to no avail because the moment you take them or oh, bail and not jail is the rule Mm-hmm. and you know 99% of our um, uh, under trials they they 99% of them are fighting their cases from outside the jail mm-hmm. because they are all out on bail they are out on bail and because they are out on bail their chances of getting a conviction police chances the prosecution's chances mm-hmm. of getting a conviction get lower and lower as they come out on bail because right. they can manage more from outside than from being within a jail from so bu- this is a problem really police is facing and mm-hmm. some kind of uh, you know Uh, one will have to think of some mechanism where in ca- extreme cases or heinous crimes or terror crimes this kind of a thing can be balanced by they, they always say that the criminal is always the two steps ahead people. of the law that's what abhijit ayer mitra was also trying to say but here it's not two steps it's about five steps ahead the, because it's whether they are inside jail or they are outside jail they seem to be managing their affairs equally well look at the case of lawrence bishnoi and what they did with siddu musewala and what they are running the gangs in punjab they are doing it from inside the r jail so uh, so whether they are in jail or out of but the fact is that they have a legal mechanism they have a mechanism ready they have a machinery which comes out and backs them and uh, and tells them and gives them cover fire it, it gives them cover fire lawyers pahunch jate hain inki bail ke liye agle din pahunch jate hain kis ground pe uthaya hai 
कोई एक बड़े बड़े लॉयर बड़े बड़े लॉयर सर बड़े बड़े वकील मैम मैं बड़ा छोटा नहीं कह रहा हूँ बट वो आ जाते हैं वो कहते हैं ह्यूमैनिटेरियन ग्राउंड बिकॉज बेल इज मैंडेटरी जेल इज ऑप्शनल दैट्स वॉट आर जुडिशियल रूल बुक सेज यूर इनोसेंट अंटिल प्रोवन गिल्टी जस्ट बिकॉज आई गो फॉर अरमन सरमन नाम आई गोइंग टू सेम एडवोकेट्स डू नॉट है जी जी नो दे डोंट हैव द सेम एम्पैथी फॉर सम झोपड़ी वाला हु इज रॉटिंग इन जेल फॉर 10 इयर्स फॉर सम पेटी थेफ्ट नो द एडवोकेट्स आर आल्सो वेरी सिलेक्टिव इन गोइंग एंड हेल्पिंग आउट हु दे वांट टू हेल्प आउट इफ दे आर गोइंग टू गेट पब्लिसिटी आउट ऑफ इट और अ लॉट ऑफ मनी और समथिंग लाइक दैट दे वांट सम माइलेज आउट ऑफ व्हाटएवर केसेस दे आर डूइंग दे आर नॉट डूइंग इट आउट ऑफ द गुडनेस ऑफ देयर हार्ट और फॉर फर्दरेंस द ऑफ द कॉज ऑफ द जस्टिस सो यू आर सेइंग दैट इज नॉट बीन माय एक्सपीरियंस इन ऑल माय फॉर्टी सो इट्स नॉट एट ऑल फॉर ह्यूमैनिटी बट लेफ्टिनेंट जनरल केजेस सेइंग हाउ डू वी सॉल्व दिस बिकॉज़ द इशू इज पीपल now radicalizers or handlers do not need to be in india they can sit somewhere outside the country and continue to run these groups which will integrate elements from bangladesh elements from khorasan elements from dubai elements from tamil nadu elements from coimbatore elements from bhopal indore elements from uh, deoband everywhere saranpur they they will get integrate all of them into one group and it will be encrypted the need today is for all parties to get together have a consensus like what france has done that we will have zero tolerance for terror and somewhere because it is going to affect all of them see if it happens in mangalore it is going to affect activities in south india and it is going to impact on development in that region so all of them it's time that we take lead because we are doing too much into elections and all these things let us sit down have a all party consensus and hold them to accountable on that that we all agree to this hmm. and then also network our intelligence properly because uh, without intelligence uh, we cannot uh, eliminate this uh, problem uh, i know an isolated case can still take place and like what nirmal ji said what abhijit said we have to sensitize our judiciary we have to uh, take hold of our uh, regulating mechanisms uh, if required we make it simpler for people like landlords or sim providers to verify aadhar based kind of uh, delivery of a service we simplify it in such a way that he can immediately approach some uh, back office and verify that aadhar so all in all a very Yeah, it's not a simple solution lot of people have to put their heads together like when i was a brigadier and i was in bhopal we used to have a multi agency center i know if that means or it doesn't mean and and that was a state being ruled by bjp that time Jee. and central government was of congress but we used to have proper coordination hmm. so it's time that we give up this uh, petty kind of a uh, uh thing which is uh, going on unfortunately in south india hmm. and focus on getting hold of them right. that should be our ultimate aim hmm. otherwise anand we lose too much because south is our economic hub yeah but somewhere uh, the build up also of the narrative which been constructed 15th of august har ghar tiranga movement there is fight in shimoga Shimoga also saw a lot of <coughs> violence around the anti-hijab protests. Yeah, Hubli, Hubli saw uh, a lot of activity around the anti-hijab protests. Yeah, there are there is a build-up around the Ram Navmi celebrations. There was ruckus in Coimbatore. There was ruckus in Kerala. So, and suddenly uh, you see a narrative which is being built that listen, there is just too much of perhaps majoritarianism. Hinduos ko thoda ek sabak sikhana padega. you have to fight muslims are in danger nirva you see how this entire narrative is being built and then there is saying that there has to be a reaction and a response so that they are taught the lesson so a temple is targeted uh, a, an activity where there will be a lot of hindus will be targeted or hindu identity is being used to create uh, a, an act of social unrest false narrative yes yeah, false that narrative that is correct that is correct complete complete nirva yes please Hello Nirva yeah go ahead please Can you hear me Nirva Mehta We're trying we we're, we're trying we're trying to sort that audio through with Nirva Mehta BS Arun you'd like to take that how do you how do you counter something you see there is a build up do you, uh, and and somewhere does it feel it's all connected Yeah what I'm concerned is 
you know, you mentioned uh, these cities in Karnataka, hmm. especially Mangalore. Mangalore is a thriving commercial hub. You know, next to next only to Bangalore, the capital city. Mangalore is uh, you know an up and coming uh, uh, city. Uh, it's on the coast. It has a good uh, uh, you know ACZ. Uh, lots of uh, you know uh, uh, industrial houses are there. The in industries like MRPL. Mm. You know, it, it's a, an important center for petroleum, petrol products, mm. and also several IT companies have moved uh, to this uh, mm. you know to this uh, city. And the city is a border mm. to Kerala. Mm. You know, there are lots of factors which make uh, this uh, uh, city, along with the Shumaka, as uh, you know, important destinations for yes. uh, you know, the terrorists, the terror hubs uh, can operate from these places. And uh, these uh, recent incidents have proved that. So the, uh, the 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 uh, the investigative part, I think, has to focus on uh, these and the connection it has to you know the other terror hubs like uh, Coimbatore. So it's it's important that the uh, you know the police of uh, these states coordinate you know and um, meet often uh, and then come to sort of a you know coordinated effort to uh, weed out all these elements and put a full stop mm. as early as possible. You know, taking the cues from uh, you know uh, what has happened already. You know, we we can see a similarity in the methodology adopted between uh, the Coimbatore blast and this uh, the current uh, Mangalore yes. blast. You know, things like that. There, there there may be many, as you mentioned, hmm. between the Pakistani you know uh, terrorist uh, who who raided uh, Mumbai right. as well as uh, this one. So there are lots of issues which uh, need uh, you know sort of uh, uh, sorting out, and I think the police are uh, must be. You know, doing it, they have done a good job already, and uh, with the uh, NAA help, I think uh, uh, we we might see some more uh, developments uh, shortly. Hmm. Bangalore as a port also has direct connectivity with Lakshadweep, where there is a lot of nefarious activity which has been reported around some of the uninhabited islands which yes, have been used. Also. So, so which is again a co huge cause for concern. But uh, most importantly, the need for the community itself to speak up and to take a strong position against radicals and be a little more vigilant because it is one in 10 lakh people who's involved among the uh, who's highly radicalized so they should not be getting any cover fire and there has to be outright rejection somewhere you feel that is also important final word nirva mehta See, remember when the PFI was banned few months back? They were everyone was uh, you know crying out hoarse that uh, this is an attack on the Muslims of India. But now the Shari, this um, Mangalore uh, accused also Shari was associated with the is a, is accused of being associated with the PFI. Hmm. Uh, so we cannot ignore the fact that these, that these radicalized organizations, that the organizations which are radicalizing the youth of india they are doing it in the name of religion and there has to be some way to uh, arrest this uh, growth of radicalized youth and unfortunately in the south right. of india this is it's it's like an, a, a pandemic you know it's it's just growing uh, without well, somewhere any, somewhere any way somewhere to stop some them. some work has to be done on the streets at the ground level among the people itself among society and even with the police establishment agencies they have to figure out a street solution to this it's not yes, going to be solved to be, no, it's not going to be solved in the courts I, I beg your pardon, I have to wind this up. We'll take this story forward with more inputs. I thank all our panelists. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we are in conversation with Ram Madhav on partition freedom. Nobody wanted the partition, but nobody stopped it. So if majority of this country was against breaking up or vivisection of Bharat, how did that happen and who allowed it? Vivisect me before vivisecting India, said Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. But he was there when this country was partitioned and he said, convince the Congress party that what the Congress leaders have decided should be accepted. How did that come to pass when we come back?
Namaste and Jai Hind, ladies and gentlemen. 75 years of our independence. How many of us have at least thought once in our life so far, why did this nation get partitioned? Why was this India and Pakistan? Why did we have partition? Did our founding fathers really want our, uh, our nation to be split? Because it didn't split, Bharat didn't split into two. It split into three. Because India and Pakistan, and then Pakistan was East and West Pakistan, became Pakistan and Bangladesh. How much has it hurt us? Has it drawn wedges and fissures so deep that they will never be covered? It's important to go back and understand. And one of the ways you can understand is by reading this. Partition Freedom, author is Ram Madhavji. And Ram Madhavji, has, uh, we're all voracious readers. He's a voracious writer, he's become <laughs> author. He's joining us now on the right word. Ram Madhavji, namaste. Thank you very much. Thank Sir, you. Aap itna, uh, thank you. Namaste and thank you very much. Aap itna speed se books kaise likh lete hain? <laughs> Main speed se books pad nahi pata, aap is speed se book likh lete hain. <laughs> no, uh, that's not true. I wrote this book after a, a gap of one year. My last book was in 2021 and this came out just recently in 2022. Hmm. What's the thought process behind the book? We are in the year, as you rightly pointed out, year of 75th year of our independence. We call it Amrit Varsh, Amrit Mahotsav. Uh, while celebrating uh, the 75 years of our independence, which is a great cherished moment for all of us, we must remember one uh, one dark chapter of our independence movement, namely the partition of India. Hmm. Not to blame anybody, nor to hate anybody, but to draw proper lessons from that uh, important historic hmm. event of our independence movement. As you also mentioned, countries like mother for us, we yes. call it motherland. Correct. Partitioning of our own mother is not something that any son or any any child would uh, appreciate, would accept. Hmm. Nobody accepted it also at that time. Most of in, the Indian leaders were against it also. Hmm. Except for Jinnah, there was nobody demanding partition of India. Hmm. Yet India was divided. Hmm. So 70 years after, should we simply ignore it, forget it, okay, whatever happened had happened and forget about it or remember it so that two things should will happen if you remember it. Number one, of course, you draw lessons from it. Those letter lessons should empower you hmm. to ensure that there is no another partition of this country again, hmm. number one. Number two, we must remember India's partition was not just the partition of lands. It was also the partition of hearts. hearts. So partition of hearts also needs to be ended while we dream for not allowing another partition to happen or ending the partition at uh, one point in the mm. in the future. Mm. You will have to vivisect me before you vivisect Bharat. This is something which Gandhi ji ha had had said. He, it was his position, wasn't it? But Gandhi ji, Sardar Patel, they were all Subhash Bose. Name whoever you name, Savarkar. Ev everybody was alive when this country was being divided. You you also state in this that when the British tried to partition Bengal. Such was the vehement opposition that they uh, revoked it. In 1911, they revoked it, if I remember correctly. So if they could, there was so much of opposition over partitioning Bengal, why wasn't there a collective conscience that came out and said, don't break this motherland? But it's a question that you ask. You see, my book is about uh, those two partitions. The first partition was affected by the British in 1905. Mm. The idea was that divide uh, the largest province of India, namely Bengal, which had 80 million people at that time, 8 crore people used to live in that province, into a Hindu and Muslim Bengal, so that India independence movement could be weakened. Mm. Hindus and Muslims, they put them against each other, movement could be weakened. But that partition was not accepted by the country. In fact, the Britishers wrote that we thought that the Bengali would be unhappy yeah. because we were dividing Bengal. So Bengali would react, but the whole country reacted. Hmm. Lala Lajpat Rai, Bala Gangadhar Tilak, Bipin Chandrapal, three leaders led that movement. In history, we read that movement as Vande Matram movement, movement. Lal, Bal, Lal Bal. Bal Pal. And the result of that movement was after 60 years, King Jaj V had to rush to India to declare the annulment of Bengal's partition. The popular movement 
across the country had forced the British to take back what Karjan called in 1904 as a settled fact. Mm. We could unsettle that partition, uh, mischievous partition plan of the British forward by 35 years. Mm. The whole country was being partitioned. Why could we not stand up as a, as a, as a country, whole country? Why did it not stand up? 1905 also leaders were opposed to it. 1947 also leaders were opposed to it. You mentioned about Gandhi's uh, statement. Yes, Gandhi did say that in 1940 when Jinnah got that resolution passed in Muslim League conference in Lahore that India should be partitioned and Pakistan should be created. Gandhi said, on my dead body, hmm. vivisect me before vivisecting this India. In front of his own eyes, country was divided. Nehru called it a fantastic nonsense. Pagalon ki baat hai. Hmm. Nehru was the signatory to partition of India. Correct. Who was a pagal one had to you know, hmm. think. Sadar Patel said, Talwar said, Talwar bidegi, we will fight to the last man, but we shall not let the country be divided. Mute witness. Subhash Babu was not there at that time, hmm. but Rajendra Babu was there. Many others were there. So my book talks about that story. What happened in those 35 years? That 35 years back, you could prevent hmm. the partition of one province, 35 years later, whole country was divided. Hmm. You were a helpless, uh, mute witness to it, hmm. just accepted it. I, I have not come to that part in this book, I'll be honest, but I'm going to hazard a guess based on my limited understanding. Did the number of riots between Hindus and Muslims between 1915 and 1940 change the whole story on ground within society? Uh, you see, there was only one party that was demanding partition of India, that was Muslim League. Hmm. Now, Muslim League... Early, uh, 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 I mean, earlier was ready to work with Congress because Congress was ready to make a lot of compromises. So on those comprom basis of those compromises, Muslim League was ready to work with Congress until 1930s. But after Jinnah returned in 1935, it was clear that Jinnah would settle for nothing short of partition of India. But remember, Jinnah hmm. did not have the popular support even in Muslim provinces of India. Hmm. There were four Muslim provinces. In 1937, when first provincial elections were held, not even a single province supported Jinnah. Supported Everywhere him. he was defeated. Definitely. He was so heartbroken. 1945, the second election happened. In that election also, in no single province did Muslim League have full majority. In one province, it has simple just majority. In another, it had to get support from others. But in two big provinces, namely, uh, you know, Northwest Frontier Province in, uh, and, and uh, Bengal, hmm. Muslim League did not have uh, popular support. What does it indicate? What did it indicate? Even Muslims of India at that time fully were not behind Jinnah. Hmm. But what happened was, Jinnah decided that no more constitutional means. If we try to elections popular support, I will never get my Pakistan, so go for direct action. He then launched massive violence across the country in 1946. That was when the Indian society failed to stand up. Indian leaders failed to stand up. In hmm. fact, Jawaharlal Nehru, hmm. after 10, 12 years after India's independence, in one interview confesses that yes, we could have stood up, but we became too old and too tired of this fellow, Jinnah, that we decided we can no longer tolerate this fellow, better to give his part to him. No, but how can one fellow decide that a country can be partitioned, Ram Madhavji, unless that there was... You, you take the example of Northwest Frontier Province and Bengal, but most of the idea of or the seeds of partition were sown in Uttar Pradesh, Aligarh Muslim University, Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, and most of the people who voted were in all the other riyasats of uh, India. The Muslim League did win nearly 400 plus seats in the Constituent Assembly and they won it across the length and breadth of the country. So was there perhaps a group which was spread across the rest of Bharat, not in the Muslim dominated regions, which wanted to break away or that, which, which, which agreed with Jinnah? That was the travesty of India's partition, you know. Those who supported partition remained in India. Those who did not want partition became Pakistan. You know, for example, I gave you the example of Northwest Frontier Province. My book deals at length about it. Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan always stood by Gandhi. He used to be called Frontier Gandhi. Hmm. And he always supported Congress. Correct. But Congress finally, without consulting him, while he was the leader of NWFP, elected leader of NWFP, his brother, 
They were not consulted. That province was given away to Jinnah. Hmm. He comes back to Congress session in Delhi in July 1947 and sobs, cries on the dais incontrollably. He sobs. So incontrollable that Gandhi had to get up, go, hold him in his, uh, you know, embrace him and take him away from the mic. Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan says, who will trust Congress anymore? Correct. We trusted you. Now we, you threw us to the wolves. So those who did not want became Pakistan. Pakistan. Those who probably supported could not go from here to Pakistan Correct. because it involved leaving everything behind and going to another country. So it was a very, very tragic, it's actually a travesty, hmm. which is a reality. Hmm. I discussed those aspects also in this book. Hmm. See, partition story just as it's about two partitions, it's also about two leaders, you must remember. Hmm. One was Jinnah, the other was Gandhi. Gandhi. They're not two equals. Gandhi was a much taller leader than Jinnah. But these, it was these two people whose uh, politics or whose actions had finally resulted in the partition. Was it also because the British decided to give the narrative in the hands of those who they thought were more amenable or controllable? Although Ahimsa and this kind of politics was not what won our freedom. You talk about the fact that there were disparate struggles and there were huge other influences too, which Clement Attlee also has mentioned. Uh, that is true. Uh, you know, British were the foreign colonizers of our country. Why should we expect that they would be very benevolent to us? Mm. They had their own plans. They had their own machinations. They wanted freedom movement to be weak. They did everything possible to weaken India's uh, unity. Mm. It was they who tried to give Muslim separate electorates. It was they who tried to win away Maharajas in the round table. Yeah. They didn't just call Congress and Muslim League. They also called Maharajas as a separate group. Mm. They also, of course, tried to separate uh, the scheduled castes from the rest of the uh, mm. Indian society. So British did their best to create fissures in our society. But my, my point is, what were we doing? What were we doing? How were we responding? There, I think, uh, of course, history has no ifs and buts. But still, I would say uh, we had faltered at many places. I discussed those uh, mm. uh, faltered uh, periods uh, in uh, in uh, my book you are right the last phase of the freedom movement was the most tragic, tragic phase, phase. Uh, especially between 1940 or 41 42 to 47 you know uh, after hmm. 40s gandhi realizes that his whole effort of pleasing the muslim league was not working then he says let hindu muslim unity wait hmm. let my country remain united Right. He said that. He, he did says, say. He did I, don't, say. I can uh, wait for this you know, Hindu-Muslim fight to end uh, at a later stage. But let my country remain, country united. remain united. But it was too late because the price we pay, paid already was too heavy. Yeah. And he also said this kind of freedom is going to come back to hurt us in the future. Yeah, of course. He said that you are not solving the problem. You are creating a bigger problem by creating two countries in this country. You know, that's why hmm. when uh, partition was finally accepted by the Congress Working Committee, it was through Gandhi's persuasion. Hmm. Otherwise, people were ready to pounce on Nehru and Patel, right. the Congress leaders. Gandhi intervenes and pacifies them, says our leaders were mature leaders, senior leaders. They had you know, spent their whole life in this moment. Let us accept what the decision they took. You are right. It was taken by two, three senior leaders. Yes. Then Gandhi convinces them. After he convinces them, when he climbed down the dais, one of his followers comes to him and says, Gandhiji, what a great day it is. Finally, through our Ahimsa movement, we have defeated the colonizers, hmm. the colonial British. Gandhi replies, yes, we defeated the colonizers, but we also defeated the general. General. Meaning himself. Himself. I am also defeated because I never wanted India to be partitioned. So it's a very, very poignant story. True. That's why I said this. My intention was not to blame it on somebody. Okay, many people blame Gandhi for it. Gandhi had his responsibility, but so were others. So were others. Absolutely. And I have, are we split beyond the fact or torn in our hearts that perhaps we are looking at an impending partition or? Is there still time for repair to ensure that whatever Bharat remains, remains a khand? Well, that you've got to read the book to find out. I'm going to leave it just there. Ramadavji, thank you very much for your time. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to Brass Tax. I'm Zakar Jacob. Mohammad Sharik from Shimoga in Karnataka has been identified as the one behind the pressure cooker bomb 
that went off in Mangaluru. He's been identified as inspired by the terror outfit ISIS. He was planning to place the bomb in a much more crowded place before, through sheer providence, it blew up in the auto that he was travelling in. Is there a fear of spread of radical terror in the South? Something that many political parties and politicians have been in denial about? How is it that this man, who was wanted in at least two other UAPA cases, slipped under the radar of the agencies? We'll get to all of that and more in just one second, but first, the story so far. Four weeks, two blasts, both with an overlapping, sinister, bigger picture coming through. Mangaluru, Karnataka, November 19th. Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu, October 23rd. Blast in car then, blast in auto rickshaw now. Near a temple then, headed to a temple now. In both cases, bomb ingredients recovered point to a bigger terror plot in the works. This is the man at the centre of it this time, badly burned in the Mangaluru auto rickshaw explosion. Mohammad Sharik boozing with a pressure cooker bomb in signature ISIS style. Police have been on the hunt for him since September in another case. Searches at Sharik's rented house reveal indications of a bigger terror conspiracy in the making. Gelatin powder, circuit boards and more used to manufacture crude bombs. Besides signs of links to PFI and to one Abdul Mateen Taha of the Al Hind ISIS module active in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. So Abdul Mateen Taha is also his and he is a main handler as of now, as per our information of Sarik. His acts has been inspired and influenced by some terrorist organization which, ha which is having global presence. So it is due to that, and uh, he has tried to learn this manufacturing on, on his own itself. On to efforts underway to decode an under-investigation bigger ISIS terror plan in South India. In Mangluru, Mohammad Sharik, Abdul Mateen Taha, possible threads lead to ISIS. In Coimbatore, Jamisha Mubin, the man who was killed, allegedly had close links to Zehran Hashim, the suicide attacker in the 2019 Easter bombings in Sri Lanka. Again, the ISIS thread. There's also a Kerala thread under probe, one Mohammad Azaruddin, who allegedly heads an ISIS module in Kerala and Tamil Nadu. The Mangaluru blast on Saturday and the NIA probe that's underway points increasingly to a bigger web of terror being spun for South India. Has this vicious web been played down for too long? How urgent are investigations needed ahead? Is a larger South India ISIS terror design finally unravelling? All right, joining us now on the talking point this evening, S. Prakash, the spokesperson of the Karnataka BJP, Ashwarya Mahadev, spokesperson of the Congress Party, Dr. Tara Karta, is former director at the National Security uh, Council Secretariat, and Balvinder Singh is former additional director with the CBI. Uh, S. Prakash, let me start with you. This man, Mohammad Sharik, uh, who was accused in two separate UAPA cases before what happened in Mangaluru, uh, surely should have been on the radar of terror agencies, anti-terror agencies, the NIA and others, Intelligence Bureau. How is it that he was able to travel to Coimbatore, uh, to... Uti, Nagarkoil, then Mysuru, where 